Okay. You. I'm going to give you a little introduction to the exhibition to begin with. And then what we're going to do is Rachel and I have selected works within the gallery that we're going to talk about, both in terms of their history as art objects, but also as their history as physical objects that were made in a certain way with certain materials and with certain techniques. And that's where Rachel's expertise is, is really fundamental to how we understand what watercolor is all about. The Brooklyn Museum owns one of the most important collections of American watercolors in the country. And it was begun very early at the turn of the century. What we try to do is once every 10 years put on a major exhibition that draws from this collection because most of the time these works are not on permanent view. And Rachel will speak a little to why that is the case. Each time we do the watercolor exhibition, we try to have a different focus. And this time we decided to do landscapes very specifically, in part because they cover the whole range of watercolor production in this collection from the late 18th century, that is the, the late 1700s, to the mid 20th century. And the latest works in this exhibition are from the 1950s. Watercolor emerged as a fine art in the practice of landscape painting. Before landscape became a professionalized genre for artists, watercolor was used as a study medium and not as a, a medium for finished works of high standing. And when landscape began to be practiced as a more formalized genre in the late 1700s and g gradually gained more respect among artists, watercolor was a key medium in part because of, of its portability and the fact that artists going out into the field would take these portable supplies with them and be able to create their works on the spot or at least begin them on the spot. Watercolor in America very much followed in the pathway of watercolor in Great Britain because that was where it was first professionalized to the point of being exhibited annually in major exhibitions by major artists and this occurred in the 18 teens and 20s and it was very much the influence of uh, watercolor in Britain that shaped watercolor art in this country. Um, what we're going to do now is talk about this really amazing case of objects that are all materials used for watercolor practice. And they're all, uh, almost all, from the 19th century. So Rachel, I'm going to just let you jump in. Thank you. I wanted to explain a few things, as Terry said, in this case, and also tell you really just a very basically what watercolor is. Um, some of you probably know very well, but basically watercolor is pigment particles suspended in water and with an addition of a binder called gum arabic. And right, I don't know if you can see these kind of amber little round um, lumps here in, on a glass tray, that's the gum, uh, gum arabic. The gum <laughs> arabic serves two purposes. Um, it actually sticks the pigment to the paper and it also keeps the pigment particles suspended in water so they can actually have a chance to wash across the paper rather than just sink immediately. Um, you see a few different um, watercolor sets here. In the, from Renaissance, basically from medieval, excuse me, to Renaissance times, artists had to grind and refine their own pigments, which was quite a um, laborious process. It, it was something they had to be trained in to do. And kind of beginning in the late 18th century, um, the colorman trade, really maybe even earlier than that, the colorman trade was, was kind of being developed. And the colorman would, um, would develop these materials for the artist, including canvases and stretchers and pigments, and supply them to the artist. So this was kind of a, a great boon to the um, using watercolor for, as amateur use. Um, they didn't have to, to go through that whole process. In the late um, 18th century, they realized that if they added honey, to the, to the watercolor, um, the gum and the pigment and the, and the, um, and the water, that um, the cakes were much easier to use. They, um, and these, this was done in 1775 by a, name, a man named Reeves. And this, he's actually, the Reeves company is still in business today. And he um, was able to make um, watercolors into cakes. And these are called dry cakes. And what the artists would do is they would dip the cakes into water and then they would take like maybe a porcelain tray and they would rub it up into a wash. So that was one development. The next development was by Windsor and Newton in 1830 where they were um, actually added something called glycerin. It's like a syrupy form of alcohol. And this would keep the 
the colors moist. And they would pour them into these porcelain pans um, and they, where they would dry, and they, so they would also call it pan colors. But this was the very first time that artists could actually dip their brush with water onto the pan and use it directly. So this made it much, much easier, even more so than the dry cakes, for artists to take their supplies outdoors and start to, and to work that way. So um, it was very important, the colorman, as a um, kind of an instrument in the development of watercolor. Um, I wanted to mention one other, so what you see here actually are moist colors probably. Um, this, and there's a small tin over here. In the middle are, um, are drawing instruments, crayons, etc. cetera. And um, in, let's say, 1846, about 15 years after moist colors were developed, the um, Windsor Newton developed tube colors. So they had to add even more glycerin so you could squeeze them out of a tube. But this was important because artists would kind of squeeze the, the paint right out of the tube and to, for opaque highlights. So it was a whole different way of working. Um, and so keep that in mind as we, as we go through the show, we're gonna show you examples of more opaque, opaque um, working. Um, in 1834, Windsor and Newton um, also developed a new white that the artists could use. What happened is lead white, which was commonly used for oil painting, um, was known to darken in atmospheric um, pollution with um, sulfuric acid, and that would come from um, uh, coal tar that was being burned, especially in England and London at the time. And so they knew that this would darken their, their paintings. So they, um, Chinese white was, zinc white was known, but Windsor and Newton was able to refine it and make it so that watercolorists could now use it in wash. And so this also was added to pigments and made the use of opaque painting possible. And we're gonna see examples of that as well. We're going to double back now to the beginning of the show. We're going to head to the corner of the gallery over here to look at the earliest work in the exhibition. This is the earliest work in the exhibition. It's from 1777. It's by William Peary, who was actually a member of the British Army and came here as part of um, their um, posts in the colonies. And he was an exceptional um, watercolorist, but this is someone who would have been trained as part of his army training. He would have taken art courses because these watercolors were very much akin to mapping. They were strategic images that military artists would do once they came to this country or were sent on any kind of expedition. You know, we don't, we're used to just sending people out with digital cameras now to bring back images of a place that were accurate. One sent artists who were trained to represent what they were seeing. Now, I think one of the things you notice right off is it's not a terribly colorful image. And the reason is because this participates in the very early use of watercolor. And in that era, the range of colors was fairly limited. And also, um, the use of washes really was uh, keyed into the notion of transparency and watercolor in its earliest years in England was very much about transparency and manipulating washes that were not opaque. We'll see as we move through time that opaqueness becomes a real bone of contention at various points in terms of watercolor. So I'm going to ask Rachel to... Uh, yeah, what's interesting about this piece, as Terry mentioned, it's got these very kind of grayish tonalities, partly because of the materials that were available for washes at the time, but also um, Watercolor manuals were, extreme, were extremely um, prolific at the time, um, especially this time, and they were recommending for these exact topographical and landscape views the use of these gray tints. This is what they thought was best and appropriate, and they would recommend even specific pigments, which they recommended probably for something like this would be blue and red and yellow together to make something like this. Um, and also another really interesting um, point about this piece, which is different than any other piece in the show, is that it's on what's called a traditional laid paper. Um, uh, if you can see, I don't know, when you get, if you can come closer, there's a rectilinear pattern. There's these horizontal lines and vertical lines that you see from a traditional laid paper. Um, laid, that's L-A-I-D, just in case you haven't yes. heard it used as a paper term. Right, and it's kind of, it's, it's created when, um, the, as the um, sheet is formed uh, on the surface of the paper mold. Um, but anyway, um, 
what I wanted to just hear, in the late 18th century, um, artists were kind of seeking different kinds of papers. This wasn't really suiting their purposes with these ridges and all. And so at the time, um, James Watman in the late 18th century, um, really mid to late 18th century, developed something called a wove paper, where he was able to manipulate the screen that you make paper on so that you wouldn't get these ridges. And so watercolors were, were really thrilled with this development. Um, another thing that he developed, which was instrumental in the development of watercolor, along with Chinese white at the time, and along with wove paper, was the fact that he um, developed a unique hard sizing for paper. What had happened is after the paper was made, um, it was then dipped in a tub of gelatin often, and that kind of imparted a certain strength and filled in spaces, and also allowed people to write on paper so it wouldn't kind of be absorbed and spread right into the paper. And that had normally been kind of a thin sizing, but in Watman's case, he developed a very hard sizing. In this way, uh, watercolors were able to um, use water um, on their paper and manipulate it, take water off, do wet into wet, sponging and blotting, and, and all these kinds of techniques that we're going to kind of show you now, and which they really couldn't have done without it. I mean, watercolors also, you know, throughout the centuries, have used all kinds of paper, and you'll see that too. But this was really the most popular paper that um, watercolors used. Rachel and I have chosen this work by James Beck to show you the whole um, beginnings of opaque uh, pigments and how the sort of denseness of opaque colors changed the way watercolors looked and what artists were able to do. You'll notice compared to this little watercolor, this is a much more elaborate composition. This is um, by an, an English trained artist who came and worked in the United States in the 1790s, very much uh, in the mid-Atlantic states, in Pennsylvania in particular. This is a view in Philadelphia, believe it or not. And his composition is fairly more advanced in terms of a receding space, this V form, your eye is let in by this river, and the sky is really very beautifully delineated and there are many more actual details. If you look here, you're not, the closer you get, you're not going to see more detail uh, to a great degree. But here, the artist has used opaque color to describe, for example, the foam on the water going over this little falls and the heavier um, whiteness in the clouds. So I want to talk about Opacity, Rachel? Yes. Yeah, I'm going to contradict myself right away and talking about how, how important paper is, because in this case, the paper is not important at all. The paper is completely covered by this opaque paint. And, um, and as Terry said, you know, kind of in, to emulate oil painting and to give you more of that feel. In fact, this is mounted to canvas, which is mounted to a stretcher, which we'll talk a little bit about too, as we'll see further examples um, of how these things were mounted, like oil paintings. But in this case, unlike the transparent, um, technique, which we're going to see, is this was built up. You would start with your um, darks, and you would build up your pigments till you got to your very lightest color. So that's a, that's the big difference with the opaque style. And that is that is the method in oil. And so what you had watercolorists doing at various periods in time were either choosing to exploit the real features of watercolor, or contrary to that, using watercolor in a way that was more oil painting like to achieve oil painting effects and you're going to see this go back and forth there's like a pendulum that swings as to what's really desirable in England for example during the 1820s there was a real contention between watercolors who re regarded themselves as purists you know using washes and those who were using opaque colors should we say a word about that one or yeah. are you ready for that yeah I just um, one thing I wanted to kind of point to is um, the use of the tube colors in this case was very also useful for artists to be able to do this. So the development um, of those in the um, in 1840s was, was very important that helped them do this a lot. And also um, they in this one back this is an example of where he added a lot of Chinese white or chalk white or what we call body. It would add a body to the to the pigment. And that's why these are often called body colors or gouache. So I'm just kinda wanted to introduce that term which you hear a lot. They're not different? They're not different, body color and gouache? Isn't there a slight difference? Well, gouache refers to a broader term where watercolors ha are th are opaquely painted or thickly painted. It could include body color. Body color really refers 
very specifically to usually an, an inert, inert white added to it. Yeah. You, can, you may see other people saying different things. But. Oh, okay. <laughs> no, it's an important question. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think this, this uh, watercolor is really the antithesis of this one. This, the, the, war, the paper is primary. This is one of the most important aspects of the materials. And the artist here has gone from light washes here to dark. And then, which is very typical of the transparent um, technique, where you, the composition is built up with, with layers and layers of thin washes. And um, the, the darks, uh, either sometimes white highlights or reds, were added very, at the very end. But the, um, the pure white highlights are really the, used from the paper itself. The paper, excuse me, the paper serves as the white highlight. And we're in the, 1920, the 1820s now, which is the beginning of the Hudson River School and the sort of blossoming of this country's native landscape school. But initially, it was British artists coming here and doing watercolors on which engravings were based in publications. Uh, an artist like William Guy Wall, uh, Wall in particular, who came and did a serial uh, set of views that were then engraved as prints and then bound in portfolios and sold. It was one of the ways in which American landscape was popularized. But what's interesting is that the early Hudson River School painters in, in like Cole and um, Church very seldom used watercolors themselves. It was still a time in this country where there was a separation between those considered fine artists, that is to say oil painters or sculptors, and those considered uh, practical artists. And for a very long time and well into the mid-19th century, you had watercolors characterized as either illustrators or commercial artists or artists preparing imagery for use as prints. And it's only going to be after the Civil War era that uh, watercolor really is raised in terms of its stature and, and the level of its respect. One of the, are you done with that one? Yeah, or if, you know, as you walk by this, you may want to kind of notice how the artist has manipulated the washes. He's kind of probably wet the paper and, and, and blotted off some color to create highlights as well and maybe sponged here a little bit. You might just want to take a look as you walk by. Now, having talked about commercial artists, one of the really interesting pieces in the show is by a woman who was known as Fanny Palmer. Her name was Frances Palmer. And she was one of the very few women who produced imagery for reproduction as prints <coughs> by Courier and Ives. And she was highly successful in her career. And this is one of the images. It happens to be uh, of the Samuel Fleet Homestead, which was indeed in Brooklyn. Uh, when I look at this, <coughs> I'm interested in the level of detail, how this was a very literal image, and the fact that she was able to use a very precise touch. It fits into a kind of scene painting um, genre that was very popular at mid-century. And when Rachel looks at it, she sort of gravitates to a very different element. Yeah, it's condition. Oh, are you okay? Um, yeah, I mean, what's interesting about this is, is She's really combined and really matured the, the full watercolor technique is there's washes used in the background. It's built up, but there's opaque areas where body color or gouache is used. Um, opaque, you know, um, thing. She's also used um, in these darker areas. It's, it's kind of hard to see, but in the, the horses and the coachmen and some of the brown areas, she's actually added a layer of gum Arabic on top to add saturation to the to the pigment, and um, I think that's really kind of in the imitation of oil, or what you would want to feel out of oil, this kind of translucency and saturation and depth of color. But also, um, what to me is most notable about this is this dark area in the center of the piece. I don't know if you all can notice that. But this piece, again, was um, probably put on a strainer, a wooden strainer, and the paper was stretched over it, and it was placed in a frame the way an oil painting would be presented. And what may have happened was they were often using backings um, to support the paintings in the back. And there may have been a wood backing on the back, which is acidic and can stain paper. And so um, and that's something we're very attuned to in the museum, is housing, housing these pieces with the appropriate materials that are not acidic and that will not stain or hurt the paper, and so, um, which was not as well known at this time.
So for all of you who have uh, works on paper or watercolor at home and you wanted to fill out that space in the frame and you stuck in a nice handy piece of cardboard from an old box, take the cardboard out, <laughs> right Rachel? <laughs> and you'll avoid having this kind of darkened shadow on your image and that's, you have to, when you're backing things, you, you must use acid-free backing and archival right. matting and that's just a, a little word of warning. We're going to go over to the other corner now. Um, and move into mid-century. You may notice right off that this work is presented differently by us physically because there's no mat, okay? You just have a frame going all the way up to the edge of the image. This is indeed, this is the first watercolor, American watercolor, to come into the museum's collection. It was a gift in 1906, actually the bequest of a very important a Brooklyn collector, Caroline Polhemus, and she had a very large collection that included watercolors and it was presented uh, after her death to the museum. This work is by Alfred Fitch Bellows, who's one of the most outspoken proponents of watercolor in the 1860s and 1870s. And what he tried to do on behalf of American artists was to raise the profile of watercolor to prove that it was a, not only a really ambitious medium, but one that was uh, suitable for important projects by major artists and one that was durable as well. So there are a couple of things that Bellows did, uh, a few I'll mention and then Rachel will speak more to the technique. Um, the size of the watercolor was much enlarged and these were called exhibition watercolors. They were prepared specifically for annual exhibitions by the Society of American Watercolorists which was formed in 1866 and had its first exhibition in 1867. And the subjects were intended to be like the kind of subjects that were then popular among oil painters. You'll also notice that this is a fairly opaque uh, use of watercolor and more to the point from my perspective, it's one that is highly detailed. There aren't a lot of areas of really, really broad watery uh, washes where detail is unimportant. And you'll see again, this is one of those major shifts, uh, especially in the 1860s. Opacity becomes more important, detail becomes more important, and in this period it's all because watercolorists want to compete with oil painters in a very, very active, deliberate way. Yeah, it's, this is interesting. It is, you're talking about the size of the sheet. That's um, the colorman at this time and James Watman were making papers of many different sizes for the artist to enable to do this. So this was in response to the artist's um, request, probably. Um, this, um, as Terry said, is framed with, without a mat. Um, and I was just mentioning over there that proper housing is very important in the preservation of watercolors. They're very sensitive to um, acid materials and atmospheric pollutants in the air that come through. And so in this one, um, we have uh, placed it against a rag board mat, but instead, um, in lieu of the window mat, we've put in these mat board spacers. And what this does is this keeps the watercolor uh, um, from pressing against the glazing, or in this case, it's an acrylic, a plexiglass. And um, which is it, which isn't good for the piece if it was touching. So that's that's our way of kind of of ensuring that. Um, what would happen if it did touch? If it did touch, um, it can in a moist environment. It could mold could grow or it could um, ferrotype or change the the um, the surface of the paint. Um, yeah, I mean in in a museum we try not to have moist environments. We have very controlled relative humidity and temperature, um, but this is just a further precaution where you, you wouldn't want something pressed against the glass, so we just we do it that way. Um, what's also interesting about this piece is that there is um, discoloration on the back, which indicates this was also mounted on a wooden strainer, like the Palmer and like the um, Beck. So, um, you know, again, it kind of points to the, the whole presentation of these pieces as oil, as oil paintings. Yeah, a strainer generally, it's kind of a wooden, uh, it's about two inches thick generally, and it's uh, a rectangle on the back. And uh, the piece is, is done on paper. Sometimes it's then mounted overall to canvas, which is stretched around the str this strainer on the back. It's a way to kind of mount the pieces. 
Sometimes it's not mounted onto canvas. Sometimes it's just the paper which is stretched on the back. And often, because these wooden strainers they are, well, they're made of wood, and as, as I said, they're acidic, they can cause damage to the paper. So when these things have been restored in the past, they've often cut off these, um, the paper margins which were um, pulled around the back or the canvas. But we see still on the back this you know, kind of discoloration of the paper, which uh, clues us into the fact that that it once you know, was present. We're just going to move down the wall a little bit. Another important development for watercolor in the 1860s was a movement called the American Pre-Raphaelites. This was a group of artists who were followers of the uh, aesthetics of John Ruskin, who was a British artist and theorist and critic, very vocal uh, and prolific writer about art. And he promoted art that was very much a mirror of nature, down to the finest details. And what he believed was that the closer one came to detailing nature, the closer one came to achieving a sort of rapport with the divine, that this was one way of expressing God's creation, and that detail uh, was essential to creating a work that had a kind of moral value. And watercolor happened to be the most uh, favored medium among these artists, in part because most of them worked out of doors on plein air. Most of them valued the effects of natural light as opposed to studio light. Most of them chose to use really pure and brilliant colors that were applied in a very different way. Uh, in part, uh, one technique was called stippling, and Rachel will talk a little bit about um, some of the other techniques of pre-Raphaelitism. It was a fairly short-lived movement. Uh, most of these artists had finished working in this vein by the 1870s uh, or mid-1870s, in part because every object was so time-consuming to produce. One of the best examples of American pre-Raphaelitism is a work in the front room that you can look at again uh, before you leave the exhibition. And it's an, another work by uh, John Henry Hill, who was one of the leaders of this movement. And you can see the extraordinary uh, painstaking detail. Virtually every little touch is made with the tiniest brushes. Some of their brushes had just three or four hairs on them. And it was a way of um, achieving the kind of visual exactitude and truth to nature that they valued. In this case, Hill has used a, a combination of techniques. He's really um, Put, um, use some broad washes for the background and then he's kind of laid these more washy areas side by side rather than overlapping in the area of the of the arch and then down here he's really fully taken on as Terry was saying the stipple technique where he lays kind of each dry stroke side by side and and you can really see that here in the foreground and um, in this case we're saying that Watman had made these papers especially for use for watercolors, he would also made a range of textures. Um, often they kind of range from hot press, which is a smooth paper, to a cold press or rough paper. And in this case, Hill would have chosen the, smaller, the, the smoother paper because that enabled him to make these small strokes and have them, and have them show the way that he wanted them to. So just wanted. But also in this case, he did cover the whole paper but the paper still it had, to have, it had to be very white. In other words, he's relying on the brilliance of that white paper to kind of reflect through his pigments and give this the um, effect that he wants. So what you have happening by the 1870s is many more American painters are attempting to bring watercolor practice into their orbit. And they weren't sort of focused exclusively on watercolors. These are oil painters who then began to see what watercolor could do for them. And this was the case in the 70s and the 80s in particular. And these were the most active decades of the American Watercolor Society when these painters had a venue to show the many works they were producing and when watercolor sales really shot up and made it worthwhile for these artists to uh, use watercolor. These tended to be somewhat smaller works than their oil paintings they tended to be somewhat more affordable. So it offered them another way to promote and showcase their art. Many people feel that the person who did most for American watercolors was Winslow Homer. And we're lucky to have an amazing cache of Homers here that were bought in 1912, 12 of them. And that was just a year after Homer's death. 
and it was an exhibition here in 1915 that really showcased Homer as a watercolorist for the first time. People knew about his watercolors. He often said he would be best remembered for his watercolors, and a lot of people would agree with him. He started using watercolor in the um, early 1870s, using them for the kind of um, plein air that is out of door, uh, country subject that you see here. He regularly visited the farm of a friend in upstate New York and um, painted lots of these beautiful outdoor figure subjects. What we did here was we hung a Homer from the 70s next to a Homer from the 90s so you could see just what he started to do in terms of pushing the medium beyond his initial use. If you look closely at this gorgeous piece called Fresh Air, it's from 1878, He's begun this picture like an oil painter would. There is a very careful pencil outline throughout the figure, and he's built the figure up from dark to light using the white opacity that Rachel mentioned. You start to see what he's going to do later in the looseness of the sky, but everything is carefully outlined. These little sheep, her figure, uh, and built up from dark to light. Here, by the 1890s, he has become an incredibly liberated and inventive watercolorist where he employs washes in a completely spontaneous way, understanding how they will interact with one another, letting areas of blank paper remain absolutely candidly visible, not trying to um, cover everything with a wash, and using these beautiful contrasts of dark and light to show a kind of flickering natural light. And this was mature Homer. So I don't know if you want to speak to these two or move up to the other homers, whichever. Yeah, you know, I thought actually I may speak if you all want to gather a little closely around in the jungle, because um, there's actually a lot to look at for this one. Um, and I would encourage you to come up closely if you want. Um, as opposed, as, as Terry was saying, as opposed to this very calculated um, working method with fresh air, here you really see how Homer has altered his composition in many stages to really come up with this watercolor. He's used um, these kind of wet on wet washes here and he's, um, that means when something's, uh, when he applies a watercolor he may apply another wash on top of it. He while may, it's while it's still wet, he may also apply a transparent watercolor a, a layer over another after mm -hmm. it's dried somewhat so he had to kind of carefully um, judge the proper um, wet and dry phases. Timing. Excuse me? Timing. Timing was, yeah, yeah. Very important, Very important right. And um, he probably here has made some changes in where he had put these um, palm fronds here. You can see he's kind of mighted up. He didn't really take pains to cover up his, his changes. Um, we may call them mistakes, but I think he didn't see them that way. He saw, saw it as a process. And so you often, if you look carefully at a homer, you can see all sorts of things. Um, so after he probably laid in these washes and he probably had an underdrawing to lay in some of these main um, elements of his composition, he then went in and took out things by either with a blotter, he would release um, pigment. Sometimes he would use a sponge. Sometimes, um, in this case, he actually would take a brush and uh, put water on top of the pigment and then pull away, and that's where he's gotten these kind of, they look, kind of look like negative images of these palm, of these, um, palm tree fronds here. He's used it there. Um, he's used it a little bit here. Um, he's probably done some reworking here. There may have been some changes going on, and there probably was a very large change here. There may have been um, something, another palm tree he started or things, so, but he's just kind of left it the way it is. Here he's left where he may have had one of the trees go over this, but you can still see the evidence of that. Um, and in the end, he would put, he kind of added these very dark, um, very strong highlights in these palm trees. These are probably the very last thing that he did. Um, so I think that speaks to the whole notion of what we think is a way a watercolor is painted, which is very quickly and there's no going back and the artist is only given one chance and then especially in the hands of uh, an artist like Homer, but really well before this. Artists were so adept at manipulating the medium that they could make changes and they would spend a lot of time on these single objects and they would return to them and make changes after the fact in separate campaigns. We know that Homer did a lot of his 
uh, initial watercolor work out of doors at what's called sur le motif, at the spot where he found his subject, but he used his studio time to go back and manipulate what he did initially, and he was capable of returning to works and making significant changes well after he'd begun them. Um, what you're going to see in this photo is a picture of this image without the window mat. And what you can see no. under, with, yeah, yes, this is a rag board window mat. This is another, this just keeps the piece from directly touching the plexiglass mainly. Um, yeah, and you'll see around here that the painting is much darker. And that what it indicates to us immediately is that, that this watercolor has faded dramatically, unfortunately. Um, it was known really since probably the late 18th century that watercolors faded. Um, but I think people wanted to believe that they were as good as oil paintings or they were as permanent as oil paintings because they involved water and they involved um, paper. These were all very permanent things. But people chemists like Field were discovering that this really wasn't true. They really were susceptible to, um, to the if exposure to light. Um, but it was a controversy that raged throughout the 19th century. And finally, it kind of culminated in this um, event when the South Kensington Museum in London, which is now the V&A Museum, the Victoria and Albert, um, was exhibiting all of Britain's kind of most celebrated watercolors. And they had been up for 20 or 30 years, and they were uh, considering having night hour, hours, and people were in, some people who were knew that, you know, or believed that watercolors were at the light said, this is, you know, this is a horrible thing to do. And so what they did was they commissioned two chemists, Russell and Abney, um, who actually, who, to make a complete exhaustive study on the nature of watercolor. And in 1888, they published The Action of Light on Watercolors, and they did indeed find that watercolors are not as permanent as oil and that um, they do fade in the presence of light, especially daylight, especially the blue color of the spectrum, especially ultraviolet light, that they do fade sometimes when they're next to each other, certain pigments mixed to each other. They do fade in the presence of oxygen. They need these things. And so it kind of was a new standard set um, for artists. What's interesting is pigments come from different sources. Some are from mineral pigments, like iron that you find in the earth, and um, copper and mercury and other pigments are formed from plant sources like matter and indigo from the dyes they actually extract and they also each have their own very characteristic physical and chemical properties and so I wanted to just show you um, I want to show you a few things actually um, that have to do with light exposure this is a form that we use here in the museum to help us keep track of the amount of exposure a watercolor has had um, it's just a way for us to balance kind of um, exhibition versus preservation. Of course, people want to see these things, but if they're shown over and over, they will fade and no one really will get to see them in the future. So we try to balance this out and we keep very um, careful records of the intensity of light versus the time um, that they are exposed to light. And this is the meter that we use um, to measure intensity in foot candles. And, um, and then, of course, we record the time. Thanks. Um, that's a light meter. Um, and um, let's see the other thing I want. A lot of people uh, who wrote into our website or who left comments, for example, were asking, why no Birchfield? Where's your Birchfield? Well, you know, when we do an exhibition, we have to go up to Tony and Rachel in the paper lab and basically ask permission to put something <laughs> on view because if it's been overexposed, they will say, well, Maybe you can do four months now, but then it has to be put away for five years. And these are the kind of, you know, uh, negotiations one has to do, even with yourself, and thinking, well, one else between now and those five years, might I want to use the birch field? Should I save it for a project that I know is upcoming? And that's, that's the kind of thing we need to think about. Yeah, that's very true. I just want to show you a couple of samples which are really interesting. Actually, up in the lab, we had painted out some... Um, here are some strips. This is a lightly painted watercolor, a more heavily painted watercolor, and this is an acrylic. And the reason why watercolors are more susceptible to the action of light than acrylics or oil is the gum does not form a protective coating on the pigment particles the way that oil and acrylic do. And so you can kind of see as it's aid, this is the part that was folded in is what has been protected from light over the months that this was exposed in a window. So you can see that um, this is a couple months, I think. But I, I don't, you know, not even. 
but this is the watercolor where it's faded. This is where it was protected. This is a darker, um, a darker layer of watercolor, so you don't notice the fading as much because there's more pigment there, but you do see some fading. And this is the acrylic, and you can see where it hasn't faded at all, and that's for that reason. This is just another example. I was telling you that some pigments fade differently than other pigments, especially um, organic pigments from plant materials fade quite easily. And so this was a, um, a watercolor strips um, sample set that was folded up and um, put in a window also exposed to light. And when you undo it, you can see, I don't know if you can, you may have to get close, um, that certain pigments have faded, like this one, I'm going to kind of let you, and this one here in exposure to light, very, very much. So this kind of gives us an idea of how these things work. So. Um. Conservators have all sorts of little arts and crafts projects going all the time. <laughs> right. um, should we just look at the other Homer before we move yeah. to modernism? And sure. uh, Another thing that uh, Rachel and her colleagues do fairly regularly is um, treat watercolors. And what we mean by that is um, even though we take such good care of our works, uh, there are changes that continue to occur or there, there are things that we didn't uh, have the means of correcting at a certain point, but with the growth of um, treatment techniques, one can undertake things that were not possible before. And, Rachel and Tony achieved an incredible change in this watercolor, which is another, this is a Homer from the 1880s. It's Homer in all his incredible facility in the manipulation of these washes, uh, the way he does the rocks, the very sort of abbreviated way he describes those um, probably bayberry bushes uh, along the shore in Maine where he started to live in the 1880s. And uh, Rachel's going to say a word about the treatment they undertook on this particular work. Yeah. I'm going to show you, I can pass around, this is the upper, as you're looking at, the upper right corner of this image, I don't know if you can see it. And I don't know if you can see, there's little brown spots called foxing, very common um, to see on works of art on paper. They often can be from iron inclusions, but they often can be from mold growth. And these were really concentrated up here in the sky area and dotted throughout um, the image. Um, foxing is unfortunately a result of being in a climate where the relative humidity is high and it enables mold to grow. They need a certain um, moisture in, in order to do that. So in the past, that this was exposed to um, elevated relative humidity, not here in the museum, but it does leave a stain on the paper. And we were able to kind of go in and locally on a, on a table where it kind of pulls down a vacuum, um, work locally, because we didn't want the water to spread as we were working and we were able to bleach out these spots and then rinse them. And it, it, it has a nice effect. It kind of clears it out. But it also, um, what I wanted to mention is that before we would undertake a treatment like this, we would consult the curator, or Terry especially, and say, is this something do you think is worthwhile doing? Or you know, if we're doing any kind of compensation. But whenever we're doing something that cosmetically affects um, a work of art, um, we would certainly talk to the curator and, and really try to understand more the artist's intent, which they can inform us on, and really what's important about the piece and, and, how, it, and how it should be viewed. you want to say a word about your suction table? Sure. Which I find to be a really scary thing. <laughs> yeah, it's a table that's about, you know, about this big, and it's got an aluminum screen on it, and there's a, a motor that, that creates a suction and pulls down. And so we are able to block off small areas when we get this this real pull. So I'm able to put like a brush, a tiny, tiny brush of bleach on, on this. And I did, in this case, I did it in alcohol because I didn't want the water to really, to move throughout the paper. Um, and it, it will kind of, it pulls down. It's, it's kind of, it is an interesting piece um, of equipment. And it's allowed us to work locally on things that we could never have washed or never could have treated in the past. We would never have bleached this if it had an effect on the paint we would have left it. That would have been a, um, that would have been the trade-off. In this case, we knew that the bleach did not affect the pigment, and so that's why we proceeded with the treatment, actually. And the, the question is usually, the one that we banter back and forth about is, does this bother you? Because, you know, you don't really want to undertake something that might alter uh, a work unless it's essential. And the, the thing was that this image is so much about um, abbreviation. The, the degree to which he didn't articulate detail, that having those spots were disruptive. And what he was trying to do was have these beautiful 
uh, sweeps of wash that were evocative of the surface or of the sky, but that hadn't been very overworked. They were, in fact, really not. And for his, his, his suggestion of the water, this is literally two brush strokes that he achieves the view of the water. And so then for us to look, it, yes, it did become disruptive when we started focusing on the foxing in the sky, which is how we came to the decision, well, let's try and remove that. We use a very dilute bleach, um, and we use a bleach that really doesn't have chlorine in it. Um, in the past, was used often and often to make papers white, especially in the later part of the 19th century. And artists did comment on that, that their paper, don't ever use a paper that looks very, very white. You know, you read that in manuals, because they knew that bleach could harm paper. In this case, it's used very controlled, very dilutely. And after we apply the bleach, we um, rinse it very carefully with the uh, proper pH water so that it should, should be completely out of the paper. One of the most amazing things the paper people, as we call them, are able to do is actually use water on a watercolor in a way that is so controlled. I mean, there are works that have darkened overall that they literally wash. And to me, the notion of washing a watercolor is just freak out time. But in fact, it's, they're so able to control the amount of water, the time the paper is saturated, and again, using the suction table just immediately, the water is really passing through and out, if I understand correctly. It's yeah. not in the paper for very long. Right, right. Yeah. Yeah, you just don't, you, what's really great at the suction table is you don't want the water to spread either. And when, you, when water spreads and a piece of paper hasn't been washed overall, you can get tide lines, your own tide lines, and you don't want to make your own tide lines on something that Hilmer's done. Um, Right, so that's, um, that's just kind of the nature of water itself. Is um, It will move discoloration that has accumulated in the paper, and that's a very typical, typical um, problem. We're going to move around the corner and look at modernist watercolors. Um, this whole wall in the exhibition is devoted to, actually this little area in its entirety is devoted to modernist watercolors, and that is watercolors that date from the uh, 19 teens well into the 1930s. And this was a moment of great, um, of great uh, progress in terms of American art because many of these artists who chose watercolor as their primary medium, including John Marin, one of the great American modernist watercolorists, were able to do more adventurous and progressive things than they managed to do in their oil painting. And there are many who feel that this really was the moment of America's contribution to watercolor, that is, in the modernist period, because what these artists were doing, in fact, pushed the medium further than uh, European artists were doing at the time. One of the things you'll notice the most, particularly in Marin, but also in artists' works uh, by artists like Demuth, uh, there's a work by Charles Demuth over here is that these were partial compositions. They were made up of parts of forms that the artist felt were significant and that he or she then wove back into a pictorial composition that didn't always involve the entire surface. And if you consider just how much of the paper remains exposed here, it was not the way uh, 19th century artists conceived of a work where the entire picture had to be finished it had to be complete. And I just realized we skipped Impressionism, but uh, we could always go back there. Um, and um, what happened was that with Impressionism, you began to see a loosening up of application and a much more sp spontaneous and uh, quick application of paint. And at that point, a willingness to let paper read through the composition. But here, it becomes really, really very much uh, of equal weight as the painted part. What isn't painted has a strong compositional role as what is painted. And what Marin tended to do was, after isolating the kind of essential elements of a view, he would add these little accent in framing lines, which were for him a way of expressing the energy of a place and also completing the visual wholeness of a composition. And um, the paper, changes as well and I think that's uh, I think you're gonna speak yeah. a little bit about paper here yeah right yeah um, when Watman did um, develop his papers as I said he developed them in various textures 
for artists to use. And they range from a smooth paper to a moderately textured paper to a very rough textured. And you can see here that Marin is really um, seized kind of the use of the rough textured papers in this one and very much more so in this one. You can very clearly here see the difference in the texture. And as Terry was saying, he used this to further his, um, his effect of spontaneity. Because as he would draw the dry brush across the paper, it would often kind of hit just the tops of where that rough texture, we kind of call them the nubs and the valleys. And that would leave kind of the valleys the, of the white of the paper to shine through. And that, that gave a very um, spontaneous look to his um, applications of, um, of watercolor. Oh, the, oh, I was going to say one other thing is that um, rough papers were very popular with amateur watercolorists because they could be brought outside and because these were very thick papers as well, when you applied water they would not cockle or buckle. So artists had generally in the past had wet papers and stretched them so that when they applied watercolor they wouldn't necessarily buckle. But when you had a paper this thick that was less of an issue. If you want to see someone who was really giving himself uh, completely to washes uh, at this date. Uh, it's William Zorak who was ultimately best known as a sculptor. He gave up painting, oil paintings in 1920 um, after, shortly after this major trip to Yosemite, but um, he continued to use watercolor for his sculpture as a preparatory medium doing sketches. This work, uh, painted during a trip to Yosemite with his wife Marguerite, shows you an artist just reveling in his ability to control colors and washes in an incredibly fluid manner. And you can just sense how liquid the application is throughout this image. Yeah, this definitely, this is an example of the pure wet on wet technique where the artist would put on a wet, um, a wet layer of watercolor and then immediately put on another wet layer of watercolor. And in the 19th century, watercolors were aware finally that you didn't have to necessarily put one layer of transparent on top of another. You could actually mix them while they were still wet and get a whole other effect, if you were very skilled, actually, as one such as Homer and one such as Zorak. And he made very, um, very good use of that. Um, also, this paper is, I just wanted, if you want to kind of compare the texture of this paper to the Marin's paper, you can see this is a much smoother paper. And this allowed Zorak to get kind of these very uniform washes, unlike the more staccato washes that Marin was more at, sought, at, sought after. So we're going to come over here and look at uh, the hopper. And this is also a good place to tell you what these little squares mean. Um, the Brooklyn Museum was the first museum to buy a work by Edward Hopper, and that was in 1923. And it was out of the first uh, watercolor biennial that was held here. Not only did the museum buy amazing caches of watercolors early on, like our purchase of 86 Sargent watercolors in 1909 and the Homers in 1912. But beginning in 1923, the museum started to mount these annual or biannual, that's every other year, exhibitions of watercolors by living artists. And they tended to be huge exhibitions, 300, 350 objects. They were very spontaneously done. It's harder to do exhibitions these days than it was then. Then people would just bring their works to the museum and they virtually went up on the wall. There were no loan forms or insurance evaluations. And um, these, these exhibitions every other year ended up being an amazing venue for the museum to make its purchases. And every time you see this little square indicates a watercolor that was purchased out of one of the biennial exhibitions. And of course, there are many more than the ones you see on view, but it really was an incredibly uh, living way for the museum to continue to build its collection. Uh, the last biennial was in 1963, and we bought from them pretty consistently. As I said, the first hopper purchased by a museum was um, not this one, but our other hopper, which is on tour with the big hopper show. It's now in Washington. Uh, but we decided we couldn't do an exhibition uh, on American watercolor landscapes without Hopper. So we put in this work, which is a more recent gift. It came in in 2003. And Hopper, excuse me, <coughs> Hopper was amazing for making things look easy. 
What he tended to focus on was a brilliancy of light and the effect of light sweeping over a landscape and over the architecture in a landscape. He did lots of plein air work. He did many drawings preparatory to his watercolors, but they still always have this wonderful kind of spontaneous effect where you feel like he was able to do it so simply and so quickly. But they're very, very uh, involved in terms of his ability to work with these washes. And Rachel's going to yeah. say a little bit about that. I mean, as Terry said, they're, they're, it's not always easy to tell with a hopper how he's worked it because he's really disguised it quite well and made it look so easy. Um, I would say he's actually, in this one, he's applied his washes in various ways. He's applied this background in a more dry manner, where just on the dry paper. Um, in, parts of, in other parts of the composition, he's probably actually locally wet the paper, so the paper swells, and that way when it dries or as it's wet and you apply a wash, um, it goes on as a more fluid um, layer and a more even layer. So what he's done is he's worked different parts of the paper to give different effects in different areas, and um, in addition of subtractive and that kind of the techniques. And in the very end, he's put on these really kind of heavy um, mineral pigments um, that he's kind of let them just kind of flood on and, and, and be there right on top to, to give a little more of these dense areas. So it's, it's kind of it's an interesting piece to take a close look at. And just the fact that he's able to uh, delineate light effects so precisely gives you a sense of his control because he's showing you where the light struck a passage of landscape or a part of a house and he doesn't err. That's where the light is and that shows a tremendous amount of control in be able to, being able to separate the lights and darks through his use of washes. We're just going to end in the last gallery and talk a little bit about uh, watercolors of the Depression era. It was sort of interesting when we were choosing watercolors uh, from the 30s in particular because uh, this wasn't a time I had thought a tremendous amount uh, a, about a tremendous amount before actually uh, choosing the objects for this uh, show, I thought about oil painting a great deal in the 1930s, and you sort of have a sense what 30s painting looks like in terms of this new realism. Um, much of it was work done for the WPA. It tended to be sort of sober in mood and very much about the local scene throughout the country. There are images of places that weren't painted until the Depression era, partly because of these localized um, government-sponsored art projects. But when we chose these works and put them here and started to look at them, all of a sudden it became very clear what watercolor uh, shifts had been made in this era. For one thing, these pictures are really dark. And so the, the pigment changes that you'd seen in, the, in oil painting, the sobriety of color, the, the predominance of earth tones, um, the really dramatic shift away from Impressionism in particular, it becomes very, very much apparent here. Uh, there's a, a sort of heaviness and a darkness in the palette. There's a use of black that we simply hadn't seen since very, very early, uh, the, those early topographical landscapes where you have more of the, the tans and the browns and the blacks and blues. And all of a sudden, it became very, very clear how watercolor use had shifted. There was still a lot of very wonderful, fluid, spontaneous work but the mood of it was different, and it's largely dependent upon the shift in the palette. Um, you do see less impressionistic work at this point, and that's completely in sync with what happened with work in oil, where there was this sort of new blossoming of Depression-era realism, art of the New Deal. Uh, it was usually very much about uh, rural or urban parts of the country that before then were seldom the focus of artistic practice. Um, I think we were going to at least just point out on the sheets kind of how he has used the traditional practices of watercolor um, throughout the ages on, on this, even though the color palette's quite different. Um, he's really probably taken water and run it over these areas to make his highlights. The texture is very apparent, the white of the paper is very apparent. He's probably actually just poured water on right here with a brush and, and to get this fiery look of his trees. And it's, as you can see, it's kind of washed away the blue of this roof here, blue-black. So, um, you know, again, this really traditional way of working and altering the process with water. Using the water itself. Yeah. yeah. Which is interesting.
And then we even look at the Yeah, Yeah, yeah there's, we're going to finish with a work that is the latest, or just about the latest, second to latest work in the exhibition. It's from the 50s, and anyone who knows the 50s will think it looks very 50s. Um, and it, this is a really interesting work in part because Rachel did a really lengthy treatment on this object. And what you're beginning to see here is uh, a new aesthetic, and I think one influenced uh, to some degree by uh, new abstractions in the 1950s and the sense of an, an all-over composition that was less about clearly representational landscape than it was about the process of painting itself. This is called The Quarry by William Thon. And um, you can see vaguely you know, these areas of veined rock and then these spindly little trees. And um, what's really kind of interesting is that we know Thon went back to his watercolors again and again and changed them and built them up. And so this ended up being one of the really more challenging treatments uh, that Rachel undertook for this exhibition. It's one that she did uh, a blog on, which is on the website as well, right? It right. was on the Thon. Right. So I'm just going to turn it over to you. OK. Yeah, this is a really interesting piece. This is a fairly thick piece of paper, but he's added, as Terry said, so many layers, and he's reworked it so much that you can see it has a lot of dimension. It has a lot of buckling and cockling. He probably started with a brush to lay in certain areas, and then we think that he may have actually poured water onto the surface of this paper to kind of give these you know, very feathery effects. And maybe he even took a brush with water and feathered edges or any edges that he saw. Um, and then he probably went in and took a sponge or a blotter and, and created texture. He probably did this in these areas here especially. Yeah, definitely. So he's really worked this. This is the most incredible composition. And we really have, it's, it's amazing to think how he even kept track of it to make it really come together as it did. In the end, what he did was he, all, he put on this India ink and also feathered that. And you can kind of see a real running together here of the yellow and the black. Yeah, and what I want to show you, this is, it's a beautiful effect, but it did cause some problems with the stability of this, of this um, piece. You can see it especially on this bottom uh, example. It's a little, it's a little um, more um, clear. But what was happening, um, and I'm going to pass it around. You're welcome to take a look. Um, is this black pig, this um, black India ink, which actually had a little bit of um, uh, shellac varnish in it, probably um, became very brittle, and it didn't have anything to really hold on to because it, it had this big yellow layer, powdery yellow layer underneath, and so the black was actually lifting away and just flaking off of this painting, and there's a lot of it. So um, normally we go in with a small brush under the microscope and we add a, a, a consolidant. But you'll see, you could see this on the blog. As we, this, in this case, we actually used an ultrasonic mister, and we introduced a consolidant that actually has very, very small particles, smaller than the pigment itself, and was able to kind of go into the um, underneath the pigment and re-adhere the yellow, and then thus re-adhere the black. Sometimes we went in and, and worked on the black a little bit more with a brush. But anyway, so it was. Consolidation, like, basic. Yeah, basically, it's, it's um, re-adhering. I'm sorry, it's, yeah, using some type of adhesive to re-adhere the paint layer to the paper below. And that's something that we spent a lot of time on the lab doing. Um, so what would you use to touch the lab? Uh, in this case, it's a photo grade. It's a re refined gelatin in a, on a very dilute, in a very dilute um, um, mixture with uh, ethanol and water. Um, no, gelatin, well, because it's, it's introduced in such a small, in such a fine mist, one, it goes underneath, and this gelatin does, is very, very, um, it doesn't discolor or brown, um, but that is a good point. We would want to find the right adhesive or consolidant that, one, did not change the appearance of the, of the image at all, and something that also didn't cause it to stain or, or cause more um, cracking or embrittlement. Sometimes if you put, if I put something in there that was too strong, it would dry and cause everything to shrink and crack. And, and so that's what you do have to find the right balance. So as we're working, we often will take shots under the microscope. I mean, there can be, when, when we make our checklist of objects and we send it to conservation, they review each and every object for its light exposure record and its stability. Uh, that is stability determined by a physical examination of the object. So much of the change that can occur to an object is not visible to the naked eye. So they will do 
uh, microscopic exams of anything that they have the least bit sense has an altered surface. And so in this case, they would have seen the lifting and separation under microscopy. And they would also proceed with the treatment, I think, with a successive returns to the microscope Absolutely. to see what the effects of the consolidation are. So this is not something that's done quickly or uh, at a distance. This is an incredibly close and painstaking uh, process where Rachel is probably working on an area. What's the, the size of your area that you work on area by area? Well, if I'm doing this by hand the way I did the first two times, and we actually had interns to help us, thank goodness, um, is, um, you know, we may work on something like that for the day. Um, but luckily, we were able to use a new tool. Our new t we have toys in the lab, which was this ultrasonic mist. Um, this is Engelbrecht tool from Germany. And we were able to do much quicker, and we did it within a week. You know, if people have a minute, we could go back and look at the Hassam. You want to do that? Yeah. Okay, let's do that. Um, this is yours. Uh, this is a work by Child Hassam. Hassam was probably the, bo the, the best known and most successful American Impressionist painter. Um, in terms of the amount of work he produced, in terms of its real closeness to French Impressionism as we know it through Monet in particular. And Hassam worked in watercolor actively throughout his career from the 70s until the time of his death, which was, you know, 1935. Hassam had a great long life and he continued to be very active and to sell well through the 1920s. These are two works, this one and the one over there. Uh, that were purchased, they're both from 1912, and they were purchased in 1924, a very deliberate selection on the part of the museum to buy Hassam watercolors in the 1920s. And what you see is this is a real Impressionist watercolor. Um, Hassam almost always worked out of doors by this point in time, uh, certainly by the 90s, uh, and well through his career he would do on-site watercolors. And they tended to be very spontaneously done, uh, very much about the kind of uh, broken brushwork that Impressionism involved, um, a visual sense of process in that you can see where he brushed the watercolor. Uh, there's nothing sort of hidden. Um, and uh, I think Rachel's going to talk a little bit about pigments in this case. Yeah, I, this is, I think as Terry is saying, he worked very spontaneously. And because this is a watercolor medium, you can see exactly what he did. Um, he, in this case, had some light highlights and used the paper again as the whites of his composition. Um, but you can also see how he kind of flooded the back with these washes and then did these dark strokes on top, probably did some subtractive techniques in here to show the, the breaking of the water. But what's kind of really bold about this and very impressionistic is the way he's used these mineral pigments very strongly um, up here and all across the front as his last strokes. And I think that's it's, it's very interesting the way he's done that. You can see he's kind of dabbed them on wet. They kind of run. You can see the edges of them. You know, he's just really done them very loosely and um, quickly. And you know them as mineral pigments by virtue of their color? Or Yes, by virtue of their color and their nature, the way they go on. This is probably, um, this may be an ultramarine, French blue. The reds that uh, used as highlights were often vermilion. Mm -hmm. They're made from mercuric sulfide, so they're very heavy um, pigments. They have very different densities than the, than the lakes and the, and the uh, organic pigments. I guess we'll take some questions now. Would this be suitable for the most fragile watercolor? Museums, yeah, they tend to have shared standards, and so oh, these are what five to yeah. six. These are five. Five They're foot five candles, yeah. which is pretty low. What we did in the galleries, design-wise, which I think worked really well, is to use these dark colors as backgrounds. And what happens is that the light seems to be focused more on the objects as a result, and and uh, extraneous light is, uh, is absorbed. So I think we did really well in terms of using a really low light level. But I mean, when you lend a work, and this is an international standard, uh, very few museums will uh, lend a work for exhibition over, what, six foot candles? I mean, isn't that? Yeah, generally for something light sensitive, five. Five, five to eight, yeah. for something like this, five. Yeah, and we also yeah. increasingly here as well asked to know the number of hours the lights are turned on, you know, because some museums don't turn their lights off at night. We count that as double. They can't have these pictures for the same length of time if they're going to leave the lights on at night. So 
Yeah, the same, isn't interesting, the same controversy going on in the late 19th century when they wanted to have night hours at the South Kensington Museum. I was thinking, you know, some of these museums, when they ask to loan a work of art, they are, uh, the lights are on for 70 or 80 hours per week. And we ask them to please adjust it or to cover it, or that may be a factor in when the piece may go up again. Um, yeah, so we may say it can't go up for double, it has to stay off view for double the amount of time that, that we would have ordinarily recommended. And this exhibition first opened at the Frist Center in Nashville, and from here in February, it's going to open at the Taft in Cincinnati. And so Rachel or a colleague will go to the venue or, and with the light meter, and you know, we don't know what they do once we've left, but it's all in good faith, and hopefully they're not going to you know, put extra spotlights on once we've left the galleries, but they will literally test a light meter in front of every object in the exhibition and record uh, and negotiate with the designers and the curators if it's too high, and it sometimes is. You know, people complain that we don't exhibit these watercolors enough, and it's, it's, it's a trade-off, because to have them look as vibrant as they do, uh, you have to restrict their exposure, and that's, that's the long and short of it, and that's all we can tell people, but it is also why we try to do one of these big shows with some periodic regularity. So. Yeah, because once something's stated... There ain't no going back, you know. And, you know, speaking of auction galleries, uh, auction houses and galleries, you'll notice when you go in and see a Homer that's literally been bleached out. You'll notice because they don't look like that. They don't. They don't look like that. You know. Um, anyone else? Thanks for coming. Yeah, thank you very much. Enjoy the show. Good. Good. <laughs>